Hey, this is Rob Onspach, and welcome back to another edition of E-Heroes. Now, I brought John, not John, oh my God, Josh Leslie, and already I'm starting off bad, but you know don't what? Don't worry, I, I get John like, I don't know, two out of four times at least, I would say, <laughs> in, in any conversation, so this you're, whole... you're batting. <laughs> I'm batting zero. <laughs> no, you're batting 500 like everybody else, so it's, it's all good. <laughs> this this whole episode, we're going to talk about accountability and networking, and my accountability right now is shot, so <laughs> Josh, take it away. <laughs> No, I think that's accountability right there to be like, oh shit, <laughs> I screwed up. That's, that's you. You just wanted to have an example right on on the front end, and you know it, it's um, and that's dovetails into networking a little bit too. Of like, if if you're going to get your feathers ruffled about somebody misspelling or miss saying your name, you're in for a hard life because it's going to happen all the time, and it's not a big deal. Yeah, like, I mean, I, I know I, you're talking to me. Half the time I go to networking events, you know, they say, you know, put this sticker on, put your name on. And I never put the right name on it because I don't want people to instantly know who I am. And, you know, we get halfway through the, the day and they're like, hey, uh, I was talking to Frank and everybody's like, what the hell is Frank? <laughs> By that time, I've changed my sticker again. <laughs> I, I, I don't believe that you're a shit disturber at networking events. I have the hardest time believing that, Rob. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> stories i could tell but you know it pokes fun at um you know or, or it, it sort of um highlights i think you know once once you see the lack of thought that people put into you know they'll spend i don't know two thousand dollars hundred dollars five hundred dollars thousand dollars two thousand dollars more to go to an event mm -hmm. and don't give any thought as to what they're going to do at the event they just kind of plunk in there like a pinball and they're hoping that they're going to, you know, hit the, hit the right toggle or whatever in the pinball machine, but they haven't aimed the, the flapper flapper. Is that what it's called? I don't know. Uh -huh. Been a while since I pinballed, but yeah. But yeah, um, I, I've gone to events where people will walk up to a total stranger, hand them their business card and start talking like that. And I'm like, is that a way, do we still do that? I, I don't do that. I mean, in fact, uh, and, and we both know Steve Sims, and, and I was at one of Steve's uh, speakeasies in, in, uh, in uh, San Francisco in 2019, and, and uh, I, I was having a conversation with somebody, and I turned around, and I got sarcastic with somebody. I know, really, it's, it's hard to imagine me being sarcastic, but that's my superpower. The guy looked at me, and he says, Rob, you're an asshole. And I said, yeah, thank you very much. And I turned around and started out. <laughs> And it came back to me and he says, I think we got on off on the wrong foot. I said, no, we didn't. <laughs> you call me an asshole. I am an asshole. <laughs> but you know what? <clears throat> that was the ice breaker. And, mm -hmm. and we have become good friends. I've interviewed him. He's actually been on this podcast. <laughs> so he's probably going to come back. He goes, I can't believe you uh, brought well, up that did, story. You, you didn't asshole. name names. <laughs> Not didn't name fine. names. <laughs> but, um, you know. I, I think we need to be more real when we go to these events, when we go to, you know, it's all about accountability it comes back to it. And, and, you know, when people see the real you and see who you are and, and, and how you are now they can formulate, okay, how can I match Rob, that sarcastic guy to my clients? Mm -hmm. Because if, if, if he's never experienced that sarcasm before and he matches you with somebody that does not like sarcasm, it's not going to fly. Yeah, yeah, you just burn that whole, you know, interaction of uh, it's a mismatch and they don't know. I think if you're not showing up as you, both, you know, it, it's in your business and at these events or, you know, if you're putting on a different person persona right. to show up to something, uh, you're setting yourself up for failure because then they send you the wrong people, exactly this. And then they're surprised that, oh, you're not that person all the time. And I've been, you know, to certainly does dozens, if not, you know, well over, I'm sure over, it, it's got to be three, three digits at this point after eight and a half years of entrepreneurship of like different events and meetups and all this kind of stuff. And you see time and time again, people going in, trying to be who they think people want them to be mm -hmm. and putting all this energy 
into like keeping the facade of like being this person that doesn't really exist. And then they leave the event disappointed that they didn't connect with anybody or make any real connections or like feel that they really hit it off with anybody. It's because like, well, you didn't come to it. It was like this other person that you thought you should be came to the event. And I, I think it's too bad. I went to two events that uh, one was in Scottsdale and this was in 2013 and, and there must have been 3,000 people there. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm never going back again. And it wasn't the fact that it was, I mean, it was an awesome event. It was just too many people. I felt overwhelmed. I felt there was no way I'm going to meet people. And, the, and the, the people I met were people I already knew anyway. You know, there was, there was just no, I don't know, no synergy. You know, mm -hmm. I, I walk in this room, there's all these people that were all phony. I, I, I didn't feel a connection to any of them, you know. So when I decided, hey, you know, I want I want smaller, more intimate events to go to, you know, and, and Steve Sims uh, Speakeasy event, and not mm -hmm. to make this a plug for Steve, um, yeah, but but smaller events to me were a lot easier to uh, chomp on, you know, yeah. I, I I got more out of them, and and I I felt like I was I was meeting people that were more like me. And, and I, I think that as, as entrepreneurs, we have to decide, you know, are the events that we're going to, are they conducive to your growth or are they just these massive events that you're going to get lost in? Yeah. Or are you just making a deposit into someone else's bank account, basically? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, it's um, something that I've been sort of riffing with lately in terms of, I think that, um, I don't want to go too, too far afield, but that... <laughs> the the business model the expectations people have in business are changing and people used to be okay with going to a club yeah where there's just a number there's a thousand three thousand people in there here take my money um and their expectation is moving towards wanting to be in a pub where somebody like knows who they are and acknowledges them on the way out or in on the or the way out and and sort of remembers them when they come back yeah. and that only works in smaller groups of people. It don't, or it only works if you build out some kind of structure, both to your events or to your business, that has sort of that um, individual touch touch to it. And and so it's interesting that you mentioned that because I kind of have a parallel track with events. So I used to you know invest lots of my money to go big events, whether it's you know 150 people or 500 people or. 5,000 people, whatever, not too many 5,000 people because I'm in Canada. We don't do too many events like that. There might be like a thousand people, but, but still. Um, and where, where I found myself before everything got shut down was I, I took that money and time and invested it in mastermind dinners, going to other people's, organizing my own, whatever it might be, because there were like maybe 12 people max in the room. And by the time you left, you had a pretty good feel for everybody pretty good idea of like what people needed, what people could offer, where people were at in their lives. And, you know, quite frankly, some of the folks that I met through those, I'm still have like closer relationships with than anybody that I met at these other kinds of events or other things that you really get the chance to, to, to meet people as, as themselves. Right. And I think that loops back to, you know, I think there's a parallel with the events that Steve runs and that sort of format of like, he caps it at 40 people purposely because as soon as you get past it it's like well there's no chance that you're ever going to connect with everybody here like right. 40 is already like it might not seem like a lot but it's a lot if you actually give a shit about all the people that are showing up to this event and have any design on trying to meet them over the course of two or three days yeah. you still got your work cut out for you so yeah and a good good many of the, the participants at steve's event that i attended to have become part of my e-heroes podcast and, uh, you know, we, we've, we've spoken about the event, we've spoken about, you know, each other and, 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 you know, we've developed this relationship and, and, and I've gotten business from it, you know, they've gotten business from, and, and it's great. I, I, I don't think I could do that in, in a huge event. Now, you know, the, the pandemic changed the whole spectrum, the whole environment of, of, you know, masterminding accountability. And you and I actually met on Steve's, uh, I guess it was it was more of a Zoom like, event. Mm -hmm. 
But, um, yeah. you know, you were cataloging all the people's information that attended, which was great, you know, and, and now we can just go back and say, hey, you know, I think I need to know a little bit more about that person that spoke. I don't really know who they were on the Zoom, but now that it's on the list of people, I can kind of go back and reference it. And it makes it a little easier. And and I appreciate that because I can't remember everybody's name on on Zoom, you know. And, and, and for me, going to events was, you know, we talked about this off air, is, is that it was like the hall monitor. I would go out and, and just meet people in the hall and talk and, and I could care less who was speaking on the stage. Cause you know, for me, it was going there to network, not to really listen to stuff I already knew anyway. It was, mm -hmm. so, you know, going to these zoom events, you know, I'm, I'm listening to the speaker. That's great. Um, and, and for Steve, I love it because it's not just, it's, it's not just, um, Learning talking it's, head it, kind it, of thing, it, right? Yeah. yeah, you know, we we do interact. You know, he gets the the audience to engage, but that after effect where you have that list that we can now reach out is kind of like that uh, that hall monitor. You know, you have the names of people that now you can connect with, and that's great. Yeah, and and uh, so the event that you're referring to is uh, so Steve was running these virtual happy hours, right? So when everything was locked down and couldn't do anything. And, you know, I, I think there's some something to riff off there to tie it back to why the most interesting conversations happen in the, in the hallway that I'll loop back to in a minute. But uh, but I, I think it's uh, relevant to how people were showing up because he made a point to say, like, this is not about like not only is it not about business. If you mention your business and pitch yourself like I'm going to boot you from the call. This is just to show up and like talk about nonsensical things and just have a bit of stress relief for everybody who's like been locked up for days or weeks or months. And, um, and I think that there's a bit of a magic that comes there because people kind of have permission to just show up and just be them and not be prospecting or worrying about who is either, you know, a good fit for them as a client or a good fit, you know, that they might need for help in their business or whatever it was. You're not even thinking about that. And the way that I connect, you know, I wasn't really thinking about, I haven't given this any thought until our, uh, conversation off off air beforehand, but about like why do the most interesting conversations happen in the hallway? It's when you're like popping out for a bathroom break or a coffee. We were talking about you know people put on like a different persona sometimes or who they think will want to be, mm -hmm. and as soon as they step out of the room of like all the people sitting at the tables or whatever the setup is, guess what? They like left that person in the room, and they're just a person themselves going to get coffee or going to the bathroom or doing real human things and when you connect out there i think that they're more open and in some ways sort of caught off guard because they're like oh hey yeah i'm a human too we're, we're both at this event we're both in the hallway doing human things and so like hey how's it going yeah and i think that there's something about that that leads to better connections better conversations and what we were talking about you know before we hopped on air was definitely the best connections that I've made are the hallway conversations or the yeah. folks that you meet, not because you're sitting beside them, but because you bump into them or, you know, met, met them over the croissant table or whatever it might've been at, at these events. Yeah. So how do we, how do we expand that? I mean, we, we meet them, you know, in the hallway, we connect with them, but now how do we take that and, and, and be accountable to each other? Well, I think, you know, it depends on the nature of your conversation, but but almost always, if you have spent, you know, even 10 minutes talking to somebody, not everybody is this way. I suspect you are this way. I, I know I'm this way. And, and and a lot of folks that are in Steve's community are, are thinking about who do I know that either could be helped by you or or you could help. And you might even drop that in conversation. I think certainly if you do drop in conversation, like, oh, my friend Greg would be amazing. You should talk because you guys would really get along or whatever the reason would be. And then you never follow up. Like you might as well not have invested the time because mm -hmm. you just set, you know, you, you didn't set a really good foundation for any long-term relationship for that person right. because you didn't follow through. Um, and I think even if you don't talk about it, 
um, going back afterwards, whether it's going to your hotel room at night or on the plane home or whatever, is to think about who did I meet and how can I like enrich their lives or improve their lives by connecting them, like opening up my network or opening up my like the, the folks that I know or, or the um, opportunities that I know about to them and leave their life a little better than before they bumped into you over coffee or whatever it might have been. Yeah. Uh, t- to me, that's that's how I would answer that question. But one of the uh, one of the stories I like to tell, and, and this actually came out of one of Steve's events, is that you know we're riding in this bus, this whole group of us, and I had my bag with me, my my uh, knapsack, and 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 uh, somebody asked, you know, uh, if if anybody on the bus had an aspirin. And I had, uh, you know, a Tylenol in my bag. I said, yeah, I do. If you want some, I'll, you know, and I threw him the bottle. And I said, take you know, how many ever you want. <clears throat> and um, he gave it back to me. And probably a day later, he contacted me and he says, hey, uh, you know, I, I just want to say thank you. And I, I know we didn't get a chance to talk on the bus, but, you know, that really helped my headache. What do you do? And, uh, you know, I ended up, you know, we ended up uh, talking a little further. We had a few phone calls. I ended up doing business with them. I probably made probably twenty thousand dollars off of them. So, you know, if you're a hospital and you're only charging fifty bucks for this aspirin, well, I just charge like twenty five thousand dollars. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not saying that you know take aspirin with you all the time, but every opportunity that you have to connect with somebody, it doesn't always end up with money. Maybe you're giving them something but they're going to remember who you are. And if you can, you know, learn to strike up a conversation later, something may come up of it, you know? Um, just well, and, 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 and I think not being transactional, right. In, in your yeah. conversations and expecting that it's, you know, going to lead somewhere necessarily right. is a, a mistake. A lot of people make. And, and one is also thinking just about the person in front of you. Mm-hmm. And not about who is around that person, their family, their friends, their advisors, the, the group of people that are closest to them. I think if you and, and it's not like having this as a, a strategy going in, it's a reality. Everybody has that around them. You've got a big group of people that you know and love and like invest your time with. And maybe you're not like at all in the in need of whatever this person does, but maybe your best friend or like this person who's been in your, you know, corner for, for years, super needs that right now. Mm -hmm. And because you invested the time to get to know each other, it's this, you know, one degree of connection of who, who they know, who they're connected to that actually needs or cares or, you know, is, um, can benefit from like being connected to you is how you get that connection but it's not showing up expecting that hey do you have like an uncle or daughter or whatever like it's not how it works it's just actually showing up and giving a shit i think is like the secret sauce right that nobody talks about right so you know we've talked about accountability and 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 masterminding but how do you come into this picture i mean how do you help people uh well a few few different ways i mean i run uh have run mastermind groups for a few few years now um right now i'm focused more on on twitch specifically of live streaming and and bringing more entrepreneurs to that platform because i i think you know one of the things that um people and these two things connect i always connect the stuff it might just take me a minute to get there but uh (laughs) um but uh Something that people don't know is, and it relates to the other thing that I'm focused on right now, is, um, you know, DJs basically lost their way of life when the pandemic hit, the travel industry shut down, entertainment, you know, uh, hospitality all all got impacted. And what happened was all these um, DJs, well, not all of them, but a lot of them took to Twitch to live stream DJ sets because you can get paid for streaming on there if you put in, you know, enough time and 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 make enough connections with people with with what you do on there but an interesting thing happened because up until that point only like 15 to 30 year olds were on twitch Mm -hmm. but these djs all had followings of folks that are more like 30 to 60 years old 
And when they went on this, you know, they didn't bring all of their people from Facebook or Instagram or all these places on there, but they brought some of them. And so there's now a group of people that are on this platform that, you know, it's great that they can listen to music all day, but I think that they're uh, more interested to hear other kinds of things as well. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot, there's a opportunity, I think, for, for folks who are, uh, you know, entrepreneurs that know stuff. Uh, that want to share that stuff that you might be doing the exact same thing that you do on Facebook or Instagram or elsewhere, but because there's just nobody doing that, there's, there's a bit of a, a blue ocean there right now to, to get on the platform. So that's where I'm focused in helping entrepreneurs these right. days. You know, I, um, I, I knew my kids were using Twitch, um, but I never knew that it was, was designed to help market DJs. I mean, that to me, that's, that's, probably one of the, the 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 channels that I would probably never even think about you know utilizing well and it wasn't really designed for that too right so that there's a bit of friction there because they kind of just cobbled on the platform and they even you know I don't know it's it's big dumb company stuff where I see these things happen I'm like oh that's a big dumb company decision where uh, they used to call twitch twitch prime if you were like a paid member of their platform or like the, you know, Amazon bought a few years ago. And so they've been gradually assimilating it into the larger, oops, larger, um, um, you know, Amazon ecosystem services. But one of the things that they did was renamed it from Twitch Prime to Twitch Gaming. No, sorry, Amazon Gaming. Mm. Just be so it could match like Amazon Video and Amazon whatever. But what they, they renamed it in like August last year. So this is a full, if, if you look at the stats from Twitch, their number of streamers and number of viewers doubled as soon as the pandemic hit, which shouldn't be you know, a total surprise. Mm -hmm. But most of those streamers are not gamers, right? Wow. They're DJs, they're musicians, they're other people doing other things, people doing I don't know, visual ASMR thing, like all kinds of stuff that people are doing to eke out a living right now by streaming. And so they go ahead and name the platform Amazon Gaming because they had that plan probably six months before the pandemic and just went, went ahead with it. And so that doesn't help matters either that the platform is, you know, no, known this way, um, or at least the program's known this way. But um, what I was going to say was, you know, the, the project that I'm working on trying to help them is um, most like, I don't know, probably 95% or more of Amazon Prime members don't know that they actually have a free Twitch subscription that they can use every month. And so you no, can I didn't know that either. Most people don't, right? Like I I, I think it's more like 98%, but uh, I mean I I know that I can get uh prime packages, you know, the, the free shipping and then I get the movies and whatnot and other than that I you know, I, I don't think I even explore all the different opportunities that that Amazon gives you for the the the, the subscription you pay every every month or every year or whatever it is. Yeah, well, no, nor did I before I even really started into this because because uh, I was trying to explain it. Like one thing that people don't know is students in uh, the U.S. and Canada can get Prime for six months for free because it's sponsored by 3M in Canada and Sprint in the U.S. Uh, so they get all this stuff for free, including like unlimited photo backup. And, you know, this is not a plug for Amazon. It's just to say, like, there's a lot of things that come with that membership. But, you know, what I saw was all these people on this platform, um, most people not using, basically leaving, you know, 250 US a month on the table that's going nowhere. And so essentially my project is trying to get people to pool that all to my one club night channel on Twitch. Then I take 99% of it, divide it up and split it amongst the DJs that are on there. Because even the ones that are doing really well, are, are it's it's a fraction of, you know, how they were doing financially before all this started. And the reality is for the next year, like it's not coming back to any extent, you know, to, to what they need. The person who was DJing, you know, 150 mm -hmm. shows all over the world, is not doing that anytime soon. You know, if, yeah. if they're doing it by this time next year, I think that's a pretty good like recovery time. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's sort of what I'm working on. It's something that I'm calling pri prime the decks, well, you know, Amazon what? prime and, one of my daughters got married over uh, October last year, and, and uh, the, the the facility that uh, she rented would only allow her to have so many people. So you know, we get there, 
they perform the marriage ceremony and and probably within 25 minutes they're asking us to leave and i'm like really <laughs> wow you know and and you know they were just all so scared of covid and everything everybody had to wear masks and it was like this is the most ridiculous thing i've ever seen but yeah, you, you you look at all the DJs and 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 not just DJs. We, you know, you look at anything that that uh, the DJ world in itself tanked. I mean, yeah, the entertainment like industry, yeah. hospitality industry, like travel yeah. industry. And I and I think those would would be great opportunities to network all these together. Because, you know, the, the entertainment industry, they don't know who's still around. They don't know what DJs are still in business. Um, you know, they don't know where to go to get equipment, you know. And, and it's not just speakers. It could be, you know, the music. It could be, you know, renting these mirrors. It could be all kinds of different things. Mm -hmm. Lighting. Yeah. yeah, lighting. Big, you know, because some DJs only offer music. Mm -hmm. And then some offer a whole array of other things, lighting and, 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 uh, you know, even decorations. And, and, um, so yeah, it, it, some of them, I don't think will ever recover. No, oh, well, I think, you know, at this point we're a year in, there are those that adapted to do something else. Uh, most of which, you know, the, the running joke is that, you know, that Be Bezos kind of owns all the DJs at the moment because Amazon owns, owns Twitch. Um, but, you know, I look at it the other way as like, I'm glad that existed because if Twitch didn't exist, like what would have happened? Right. Um, and so, yeah, Amazon's taken their pound of flesh for, for doing that, but they, you know, invested in the service. You know, it, it's the same way I feel it's not a fair um, thing for people to be um, hating on, on Jeff Bezos because he profited during the pandemic. Like, yeah, they made you know, crazy amounts of profit, but he's been at it since like 1998 or whenever, you know, however long it's been. And guess what? Like a lot of those early years, there weren't profits and, and people aren't looking at the actual like arch story arch of this whole thing. They're just looking at this one little slice and it's a damn good thing that Amazon exists because a lot of us wouldn't have had the things that we needed or thought we needed or like emotionally needed to buy that DVD set or whatever. Um, to, to make it through like the six months when nobody knew what the hell was going on and what was next. And, and so like, I'm appreciative that that service exists and I'm not hating on the fact that they made a profit. Like they made the investments to make it available. And, and I'm certainly happy that those things like Amazon as a platform and, and Twitch right. as a platform exist. And I think they should Profit. And like and 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 it kind of goes back to accountability and networking because it, and 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 even masterminding because when you think about your industry, you know you you have to put in the time, you have to develop strong connections with other people, because you know if you don't, when a pandemic does happen, you know if it's even for even if it's for a couple of weeks because fourteen days turned into a year, but nobody was prepared. <laughs> um, had you had those strong connections, had you had that that masterminding and that network in place, you know, you could have pivoted very quickly and said, okay, maybe I can't perform in-person ceremonies, but I can do something different that still is able to make me money using what I have now. Mm -hmm. And the skills that you have instead of retraining or learning a completely new thing or yeah whatever it might be, I agree a hundred percent. And there's a group that I belong to called corporate connections. That's like a global community. And, you know, one of the things that struck me there is because of having regular conversations with people, you know, like we have chapter meetings, you pay and there's like all these global chapters of, of this organization, but they're focused on like, how can we help you right now with what you need? And also to capitalize on opportunities that come up where, you know, there's people that were doing something totally different, but because they were connected to, I don't know, say hospitals or, or something else, uh, say that they were doing IT, right? They're connected to hospitals, I don't know, recycling their computers or th that sort of stuff. Um, well, guess what? They have a whole supply chain. They can help get uh, protective equipment to them, mm -hmm. PPE. 
And so suddenly they're doing that in addition to, or like more so than, than doing computer stuff. Yeah. But it's because they had people in the room to be like, wait a second, like, don't you have all these relationships already? Can't you leverage them to do something else that's going to help them and help you? Um, but, but we don't see if we're just trying to slog away alone, like entrepreneurship's a pretty damn lon- lonely journey. And if you're not investing your time in networking, in mastermind groups, in being accountable to the people that you meet in both of those settings, mm-hmm. um, then you're on your own, literally. And you're yeah. missing out on all kinds of stuff. And you're also getting in your way, I think, a lot more than you otherwise would if you had people to be like, can you just stop being such a stubborn ass about this thing and like just do that thing? Right. Like there's money waiting for you, like trying to get to you and you're blocking it because you're not paying any attention to it. Yeah. Um, you know, so I and think I, they, and help, I, they help see our blind spots too. Right. And you mentioned uh, leveraging connections and I think that's what we exactly, I mean, I do it all the time. I know you do it. And, 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 and we do mention, you know, Steve Sims a lot, but without Steve mm-hmm. and his connections, we couldn't leverage that, that relationship. So each one of you guys that are listening or, and gals, make sure that you have a network that you can connect with and leverage you know, because you don't want to be stuck holding the bag the next time. You know, I hope there's not a pandemic like this for another hundred years. But, you know, you could wreck your car and be out of work for a couple of weeks or, or whatever. You need to or have your back out, what, you right. know, whatever things that happen. Life, life things continue to happen. You, you need to have that that connection with people so that if something does happen, you can you can switch gears quickly and still be making money. 100 percent how do people get a hold of you where do they go um best way to get a hold of me good question um i mean do we we should all go up to toronto and knock on your door (laughs) well you you can but my dog will freak out so (laughs) um well i am on twitch every day not that everybody's on twitch but uh josh josh builds a biz on twitch um just basically you know uh, Try, trying to show people that it doesn't it's mainly about getting out of your own way to build business ideas out and get them out of your head and out, out to the market and it's possible to do that in like a month if you're blocking out an hour a day and being um, you know strategic about how you invest your time that you can do that um, so I'm on there every day from 11 a.m eastern till 12 or 12 30 eastern so people can always come say hello um, they can uh, email me, um, Josh Leslie at pm.me, like personal message.me, um, and, uh, or, or text me, 647-606-9604. Text is probably the, the best um, way in terms of, it's a quick and easy way to reach out and say, hey, I heard you on do you Heroes. Prefer, or, do you prefer text or do you uh, do WhatsApp? I don't do WhatsApp. Um, in intentionally, just because I, 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 I think know. you're like the first Canadian that said I, I don't do WhatsApp. <laughs> I'm I'm I think I'm probably the only person <laughs> in corporate connections like globally that doesn't do WhatsApp. I'm the the odd man out, but I'm like I just don't. As soon as Facebook bought WhatsApp, I was off WhatsApp. <laughs> I, I'm also a big internet governance geek, and so I you know try and keep my data. Um, private compartmentalized to different companies just so that they can't stitch together every aspect of my life. I'm okay with them having a, a, you know, a a view into my life, but not my entire life all under one umbrella, just because, you know, companies that I've trusted in the past, like Google go around and change their terms suddenly to take out the don't be evil. And now it's like, I don't know, maybe be evil sometimes. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> be evil sometimes. You know, that's like, I don't know. I, I'm I'm a guy who spent a lot of time. I worked in hospitals and, uh, you know, overseeing research for, for many years and spent my time in, you know, policies and regulations and all this stuff. And so it's like, you got to look and see what sentence they remove because it can make a big freaking difference. Um, and so anyway, I noticed this stuff. You, know, um, you, you mentioned hospitals and, you know, here in, in, in the U.S. we have uh, we have these different pi- privacy laws. It's called HIPAA. 
Mm -hmm. I don't know if they have them in Canada, but (laughs) what I've noticed that is that, you know, all these people, uh, all these hospitals and medical facilities would take their stuff outside to give people, you know, testing for COVID. So now you're outside. Well, the news crews are outside too, and they want to get information about you. And, and, and so all these medical staff, you're violating HIPAA. You're dude. The HIPAA is not on the people taking the pictures. It's on you for not protecting the privacy of your patients. <laughs> so it's, to me, the whole thing is so ironic because, uh, you know, we, we strive every day to protect our own privacy, but yet we share it freely on social media. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, hu- humans are uh, nothing if not um, ironic creatures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, but yeah, no, it's it's uh, I don't know, that's a whole a whole other conversation around privacy and stuff. But I tend to be, you know, I, I'm always the odd odd duck. Odd, odd man out when it comes to this kind of stuff where people are like oh can I, can I just send you a i'm like no can i send you a facebook message no like I'm, i don't do any of those things and and you know part of it is i like you go on these platforms whether it's linkedin or facebook or whatever and like i never asked for a thousand inboxes mm-hmm. to check like i already have enough inboxes i have more inboxes than most people i know probably almost anybody i know um I don't need a thousand more and it's no offense. I just like, I don't have time to check them all. And, and so I, you know, tried to be a little more efficient with my time to say like, I'd much rather somebody text me and I can follow up. At least there's a, a, a icicles hope in hell that I'm going to get back to them compared to some Facebook message that I didn't see from two and a half years oh. ago because I have <laughs> 400 of them. Yesterday, uh, my phone, started making this noise and I'm like, what the heck's going on? I don't recognize that tone. And here it was somebody trying to Skype me and I'm like, I haven't used Skype in two years. <laughs> like, what is this? I don't even know how to use it anymore. <laughs> you know, uh, a lot of people just uh, Facebook me. Uh, they either message me or send it. And I'm like, you know what? I'm kind of like you. I, I, I want a simple product. I'm thinking about getting rid of my phone and going back to an old ancient phone. Yeah, you know, it just mm-hmm. does phone calls. Doesn't even Mo- do Motorola Razor. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because sometimes I think we become too accessible. And I know the whole this whole conversation is about accountability and masterminding, but I think sometimes we have to be accountable to ourselves. And you know, when when our time is being taken away by people you know, trying to communicate to us in all these different devices, you know, um, we're doing a disservice to ourselves and, and we're, we're kind Mm -hmm. of giving away our time. Yeah. Well, and, and, or having it siphoned off depending on how how you look at it. Right. And, and almost always, and, you know, it's no offense to people like people have questions, they have things that they need, they have, you know, things that they want to help with. But I would say if I if I paid somebody to do an analysis of my Facebook messages and LinkedIn messages over the last five years, what percentage of messages were, hey, can you do something for me or help me with something or whatever versus, hey, I noticed your thing and I want to help you with that. I'd say it's probably at least 99 percent the first one and maybe one percent. And it's and that one percent are from people that I know and am in contact with outside of those platforms. Yeah. And so to your point, I think it's super, um, it's a super critical point that I'm glad you brought up in in this, like context of this conversation of if you're not guarding your own energy and time, Mm -hmm. that's a disservice to all those people that you actually, you know, are trying to be accountable to and follow through on the things that you said, because guess what, you said you make an intro, and I'm certainly not perfect at this, I've been, you know, working for years to get better on my, you know, having a shorter cycle time of, of connecting people. Um, if you say you'll do that, but then you let 50 other things get in the way that aren't important to you, they just happen to show up in front of you um, because you've let all these apps sort of have these tethers to you on your phone, on your notifications, on your computer, whatever it might be. Well, how do you, how can you possibly hope to have energy left by the end of all that to remember to even do the thing that you said that you would do instead of starting your day that way? And so I guess the only other share I have on that is 
carving out dedicated time each week to make those connections mm -hmm. has become something that's like golden time in my schedule that I don't, you know, let anything encroach on that. I mean, it's half, you know, there's shit that happens, life things happen, but generally speaking, like I'm not going to take meetings during that time because that's the time that I'm following through on what I said I would do. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't think a lot of people necessarily carve out time that way. Uh, and if, you know, my thing is if it's not my schedule, it's not happening pretty much like almost guaranteed. And so blocking out that time, whether it's, you know, to follow through on the things that you said, or just your own time of like things that you need to refill your, you know, cup, recharge your battery, whatever analogy you want to use around it so that you can show up as, you know, a good version of yourself when you show up on a meeting with somebody or on a phone call or an event when we can be at events, uh, you know, that kind of stuff is um, not, people don't, I, I think they're probably talking about it a bit more now, just because everybody's like so sapped and tired and don't understand why they're tired. Um, a lot of it's because you forgot, like that's just stuff fell off the schedule, fell off the face of the earth as far as you're concerned to actually take care of yourself. And like, maybe you just need a nap, like take a friggin' nap. Oh, I, I take naps all the time. <laughs> Same. You know, you gotta, like, you know, you, you gotta sometimes, you know, take care of yourself first. And, uh, you know, the, the analogy is, you know, if when you're flying, one, we can fly again. I mean, I, I've flown, but some can't. The, 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 the announcement always says, if the airbags come down, you put it on your face first before you put it on your, your child next to you, because if you pass out, then who's going to help them? So sometimes we have to help ourselves first. And, and, and so accountability is not just helping other people, but making sure that you're helped. And um, well, making sure that you're, you are able to help other people because yeah. you took, took enough care of yourself that, and it's not just to take enough care of yourself today or next week. It's like, it's, it's a marathon. Like right. if we're lucky, if we're lucky, we get to stick around and be here for the long run. And so if you're doing stuff that um, is, you know, it might be, seeming to help you win the race and you know i've learned that stuff the hard way of sleep packing and all these other things that like sure it helped me win the race but i'm, I'm sure i probably carved a few years off off my life by getting getting short-term gains from you know uh, stuff that was not really taking care of me right or like given too much to the projects or the people or the things that i committed to and so there's there's also a thing i i think a thing is over accountability as in doing too much and like encroaching on on accountability to yourself which is exactly what you've been talking about of like basically borrowing from your own energy banks or your own sleep banks or all these things that are actually important to us sticking around and being able to to be there for people um that's it's huge and that's definitely a way way more top of mind for me now eight and a half years into entrepreneurship than it wasn't even on the radar probably for the first three or four um much to my chagrin. I, I like to think that I'm just skipping like the, you know, decade where I'll be senile and incontinent, but uh, <laughs> pro probably not. But <laughs> So if you want to learn more about Josh, visit him on Twitch at uh, Josh Builds a Biz. Hey, this is Rob Onspach. We will see you on the next episode. Adios.